another young guy and I uh, decided that uh, we were deer hunting. We got we got uh, packed in by uh, outfitter on horseback. We went 12 miles in, uh, but we had uh, rented uh, two horses and a mule while we were there. The outfitter had told us how to how to take care of each of the animals, and this this mule, Nancy, her deal was you put her out on about a 30 foot lead, and he, he'd say tie her to a tree out of the meadow. She'll just graze all night. That's what she wants. So that's what we did. We were about ready to pack it in that night, and Nancy just started going nuts. She was scared. She had her leg pulled up had been injured and her uh, eyes were big her ears were back her no nostrils were flaring and she was staring off out into the darkness we thought what the heck happened she had injured her leg and she couldn't put any weight on it uh, just about the time we we're ready to get back into our tent we heard this god awful scream that was i mean to this day i mean this still makes my blood run cold thinking about it it started out like the Alfred Hitchcock woman getting murdered. Just bloody murder scream. And then it went into this ah, long drawn out thing and ended it like when the lions were. And lasted, you know, 10, 12 seconds. And we thought, what in the heck was that? And we got out, you know, looked all around everywhere, couldn't see anything. And it's just dead quiet out there. Let me tell you what, we were shook up. We were shook up. Uh, well, I'll tell you, and, and I've been hunting for several years, and I, I'm, I'm not too proud, man, to tell you that I slept with my loaded 30 out 6 inside my sleeping bag with me that night. I was, I was petrified. Joining me on this episode of Bigfoot Crossroads is a guy that I should have gotten on years ago. Uh, it's someone I followed through the years. He happens to be married to a wonderful, wonderful lady that I, I've also known for years and years. Mr. Bob Strain, how are you, sir? Well, I'm doing pretty good, Matt. It's good, good to talk to you, brother. Yeah, man. Yeah. You're originally from Texas, right? That's correct. And then you moved out to the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, I did back in uh, back in the seventies. Yeah, I was born and raised in West Texas, and uh, went to school there, high school, a couple of years of college, University of Texas, and uh, my dad lived out here in the uh, Sierras in California, and. Uh, came out here and you know there's no comparison to you know <laughs> the high sierras to west texas they are completely different <laughs> yeah so yeah i, like I would it. imagine yeah. uh yeah did you grow up with you know some sort of interest into bigfoot or anything no i really didn't as a matter of fact i really had uh, very little you know knowledge of of bigfoot at all it was never on my radar screen growing up i mean i may have seen um you know clips from the patterson gimlin film and maybe the leonard nimoy um uh, show that was that was on back in the day but i never paid any attention to it never gave it any stop never even really thought about it and uh it was just something that um kind of you know, crept into my life years later, but um, I mean, I'll tell you, I, I'm a big hunter. My dad was a big hunter, and uh, the year I graduated high school, 1975, um, he and I went on a, uh, a week-long hunting trip up in Idaho, and I had some experiences up there that kind of stuck with me, and that kind of like... You know, sat in the back of my brain. It was one of those conundrums I could never figure out. And then with the advent of the um, Internet coming along in, uh, you know, late 
uh, late last century, um, early 2000s, um, kind of crept back in as I started reading more about it and put two and two together and realized that experiences I had in Idaho back then and other experiences in the 80s out here in California as well, that it was the only explanation that I could find was that it was, it had to be Bigfoot. And, you know, that's, that's where it all started. The incidents that happened, especially the one when you were hunting with your father. Yeah. Did those things kind of stick with you through the years and like bother you? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, well, oh, absolutely. You know, it's just, you know, those uh, remembrances of your earlier um, life, uh, kind of, you know, as you start to get older, more mature, you start to like, like to try to put everything in its place. And um, that was something, um, especially the Idaho experiences um, that I, I could not, I could not uh, reconcile. Uh, I just couldn't. And, um, and, and it did bother me. And, and I thought about it from, I would think about it from time to time. And, um, you know, it was just one of those things that, that it really troubled me. And, um, you know, it was something that I was fortunate enough to, in 2002, to, to just happen, just by happenstance, happen across the old Bigfoot forums that Brian Brown started in 2002, and I was one of the first members there. And, um, you know, I kind of felt uh, kindred spirits there. And it was through interactions with um, uh, the people there whom I became friends with, uh, many of them, um, kind of helped me sort through it and realize that that's that that's uh, what I had experienced was uh, some some um, you know fairly close interactions uh, with Bigfoot. Um, you know, I had a I had a sighting in in 1975 um, that uh, 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 several minutes long, as a matter of fact, and I, I watched this creature on a hillside through my rifle scope that I initially thought was a bear, and um, I was going to shoot it. Um, and I was waiting for it to get to a spot to where it wouldn't fall down into this really steep canyon. And uh, I was trying to make it easier on us to retrieve. And it climbed up to a, a level spot on a hill. And I was just about to pull the trigger, had it in my sights. It was in my crosshairs. Had my finger on the trigger, I was starting, I was controlling my breathing and trying to figure out my drop of my bullet at that range. And it stood up on two legs and turned around and walked one way and walked the other way. And I realized that it was not a bear. And um, at that time, I thought it was human. I couldn't exactly figure out why a human was doing that and why it was you know, all dressed in black and covered in fur and, um, you know, but I was, I was kind of, I was kind of upset that I almost, uh, I almost shot a person as what I thought. And I, was, and I just watched it, uh, walk away. And a couple mornings later, um, we were, um, it had, had snowed, uh, the next day it snowed, uh, pretty heavy. And so we hung out in camp. And then the day after that, uh, before dawn, we were driving up this, uh, this, uh, mountain logging road, fire service road. And it was a little two track and, uh, it was before dawn and our headlights reflected off the snow and it looked like a burned out stump on the right side of the road. And as we're approaching it, the stump <laughs> started morphing. In other words, it was tall and, you know, not really thin, but it was broad, but it was tall. And it started shrinking and got wider. And then it uh, slowly crept across the road. <laughs> Excuse me. It looked like a, um, I described it as an oil slick moving across the road very, very slowly. And then went down over the edge and knocked a bunch of snow off the tree and um, we stopped where it went uh, over the side and went and sent a guy off over the edge. 
uh, with a flashlight and a pistol and said, you know, here's your chance to be a man, go figure out what that was. <laughs> and he came back in a, in a big hurry and said, nope, 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 let's go, let's go, let's go. And he didn't want to talk about it. And uh, he, he said it was covered in fur. And first he said it was an animal hiding in the tree and he wasn't going to shoot at anything he couldn't identify. And, and we went up to the top of the mountain and hunted and didn't see anything. And we came back to uh, the truck and it had continued to snow. And so it was fresh snow all the way around the truck. And uh, we found these giant footprints. Um, they were huge. And um, um, we're looking at him, and I asked my dad, I go, my dad, that doesn't look like a bear. And he says, got to be a bear, son. There's nothing else, you know, like that. And, and uh, but it looked like giant human footprints that had circled the truck. And, um, and you know, it was the, all, all these, the combination of things, um, you know, just I, I could not, I could not wrap my head around it. And on the way back down the hill of uh, that day, uh, we stopped at the same spot again and tried to see if we could find any kind of tracks or anything where the thing had crossed the road. And, um, by this time, the guy that went over the edge had come up with a, he come up with a story. He said, "Well, I, I've been thinking about it, and I think the only thing it could have been was a hunter on horseback wearing a fur coat with the hood pulled up over his head." I thought, "How? How did you come to that? And did you see a horse?" He said, "Well, no, but it had to be a hunter on horseback because that's the only way he could have been that tall." And so he did see something walking away from him, and I. Uh, said he didn't see a horse and and i thought you know anybody who's savvy enough to ride a horse in the snow in those mountains is not going to be wearing a fur coat black fur coat with the hood pulled up over his head in, in idaho um you know that just didn't make sense to me and it was in an extremely remote location on the edge of um what was then called the Salmon River Wilderness Area, now it's the River of No Return Wilderness Area, up near the Montana border, north of Chalice, probably 50 miles north of Chalice, Idaho. And, um, and it, that was, it, it, it just, I, 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 for years, it bothered me. It, you know, it's just something like, what? You know what is 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 going on with that, and and I, and I couldn't figure it out. Um, we were big hunters, and we had a, a group of us that about eight or ten that we would go hunting with uh, friends of my cousins, and um, we had another experience um, several years later, it was about 1980 or so, I'd say, and um, we were in the Trinity River. Um, the Trinity Alps, Trinity Alps Wilderness Area here in Northern California, not far from the Marble Mountain Wilderness, and uh, up towards the Six Rivers area, which is where Bluff Creek is. And um, uh, another another young guy and I uh, decided that uh, we were deer hunting. We got we got uh, packed in by uh, outfitter on horseback. We went 12 miles in. And he left us there for a week and came back and retrieved us later. Uh, but we had uh, rented uh, two horses and a mule while we were there. And so me and this other kid um, took the mule and put our uh, some overnight camping gear on it and hiked up. Uh, had the mule pack our stuff up to the ridge across this big valley where we were camped. And... Um, we're having our, our little, uh, you know, spike camp up there. And um, the outfitter had told us how to how to take care of each of the animals. And this, this mule, Nancy, her deal was you put her out on about a 30-foot lead, and you, he'd say, tie her to a tree out in the meadow. She'll just graze all night. That's what she wants. So that's what we did. It was only maybe 100 feet from our from our tent and we were about ready to pack it in that night about 10 o'clock at night and nancy just started going nuts just absolutely bonkers so we ran over there check her out 
She was scared. She had her leg pulled up, had been injured, and her uh, eyes were big, her ears were back, her no nostrils were flaring, and she was staring off out into the darkness. We thought, what the heck happened? She had injured her leg, and she couldn't put any weight on it. We thought something had clearly bothered her and harassed her, we figured. And we didn't know what it was. So we, you know, we, we untied her and we brought her back into our little camp area and tied her up just right next to our tent. And she was unsettled. We were unsettled all night long. And uh, just about the time we're ready to get back into our tent, we heard this God awful scream that was, I mean, to this day, I mean, this still makes my blood run cold thinking about it. It started out like the Alfred Hitchcock woman getting murdered. Uh, movie uh, sound effect, just bloody murder scream, and then it went into this ah, long drawn out thing, and ended it like when the lions were and lasted, you know, 10 12 seconds. And we thought, What in the heck was that? And we got out, you know, looked all around everywhere, couldn't see anything, and it's just dead quiet out there. Let me tell you what, we were shook up between those two, <laughs> you know. We yeah. were shook up. Oh, well, I'll tell you, and, and I had been hunting for several years, and I, I'm, I'm not too proud, man, to tell you that I slept with my loaded 30 out 6 inside my sleeping bag with me that night. Um, I was, I was petrified and, um, of course we didn't see anything the next day. We didn't see any deer, nothing. And, um, and, uh, so my dad, uh, and a couple others came up to check us out the next day about noontime. They showed up. And we told them what happened, and so we all, you know, packed up our gear, and we had to lead the mule back. And on the way back down, I found this spot that um, looked like a bed. Um, I mean, not exactly a nesting area, not like the Olympic Project nest, but but it was a flat area. It had been completely... Uh, uh, cleaned off of all sticks, branches, and everything. And it was about four inches thick of pine needles. It was a perfect overlook, over, overlooking the entire valley. And I sat down in it, and I thought, man, you know, the, you, you get a great hunting view from, up, from here. And, and I never really thought about it. And as time went by, you know, I'm, starting to like all these things are starting to add up. Well, go about another year in time. And my dad and I, not far from where we live right now, as a matter of fact, up here in the um, Stanislaus National Forest, uh, my dad and I, again, um, getting ready for deer hunting, went up on the edge of the wilderness area. And we, um, um, we were going to deer hunt there. And um, so we went in about a month ahead of time to build some deer blinds, brush up some blinds, just natural blinds. And we um, rolled in late at night in our camper. And um, there's nobody, nobody there. We were at the end of a road. Actually, it was a trailhead for the wilderness area. And um, we... You know, camped uh, the next day, all day long, we hiked and built deer blinds and then came back to our camp. We're sitting around the campfire, just two of us, nobody else up there. And dad's sitting next to the campfire and he's looking out into the darkness and he says, son, come over here and look out there and tell me what you see. And I looked out in the darkness and I see these two giant red, like bicycle reflector. Uh, lights, uh, not really illuminated lights, not like a tail light, but more like a reflector, a bike reflector. And I said, I don't know, Dad, looks like a couple of red eyes out there in the dark. He goes, yeah, what do you suppose that is? And I said, well, I don't know, Dad, maybe a, you know, maybe a, a raccoon up in a tree or something because it was really high off the ground, not that far away. And um, he goes, hmm, 
We all could be. It's that problem is, son, that's a meadow, and there ain't no trees out there in that meadow. So what do you suppose is that high off the ground? And I, I don't know. So I kind of walked out there a little ways, and the eyes kind of turned sideways and disappeared. Had a little, little bit, you know, a little flashlight, a little puny flashlight, and I shot my light. And I didn't see anything. Came back, and the red eyes appeared again. And they just, you know, for like half an hour, they're watching us. So we're like, you know, starting to get a little like, what in the world? And we look over there again. Now there's two sets of red eyes. And uh, the other one is just a little shorter. And then uh, out there the last time I went out and looked, um, there was three sets of red eyes. And uh, two of them, two pair kind of close to each other. And then one real close to the ground, way off to the side. Oh, man, what? And no clue. So, you know, that's, well, I'm getting hungry. Let's get in the camper. Is a cab over camper, you know, uh, camper on the back of his truck. And we got inside the camper, and um, we're sitting there talking, and he's making some sandwiches, and something smacked the side of that camper, like, bam! Just this huge explosion of a of a slam on the side of the truck. Not light. I mean, it was big. It rocked the camper. As a matter of fact, the, his rearview mirror was an old Ford pickup with those big giant mirrors on it. It revert the mirrors on his truck reverberated. You could hear it go like that. I was like, man, what the hell? So we get out of the camper with our flashlights and our pistols, and we're running around. We're looking. And there's nothing out there, absolutely nothing. No tree limb, no unconscious deer laying there, nothing. Man, what the hell? And so we're starting to get back in the camper, and and that blood all, that blood curdling scream, not quite as long as the one I heard in the Trinity Alps, uh, cut loose, and it was off, off the hill in front of the truck, down in the dark. And then immediately, one exactly like it answered from back where the red eyes were. We thought, what, what is going on, you know? And all night long, I kept hearing something movement all around the truck, all night long. Crunch, 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 crunch. And in the, in the you know, heavy leaf litter and sticks and everything, is you know, unmanicured forest. And it was very unsettling. All of those culminated, you know, and and years, fast forward 20 years later is when I um, just stumbled upon the Bigfoot forums. And not by, for looking at Bigfoot, it was <clears throat> just off a link that I had found to it that Brian had posted on some other website. And I thought, oh, I'll click on that and I'm looking. And I started reading, and I thought, what the heck? And I, you know, wasn't going to use my real name at the <laughs> time. I'm real, real paranoid, you know. So I put in, you know, my my moniker, you know, RB, uh, just something I came up with on the spot. And I thought, yeah, well, I'll just be anonymous here. Nobody will know me. And next thing you know, man, I'm in it. I'm in it. And then um, a year later, uh, the Bigfoot, uh, the International Bigfoot Symposium in Willow Creek uh, came up. It was 2003 in September, and I had talked to a couple of guys, and Brian was one of them. Brian Brown was one of them, and Tim Cullen and a couple other guys. I said, "Well, let's you know, let's go to this thing, you know." And it wasn't cheap; it was like 150 bucks. I'm, you know, it's like so this is a commitment to go to this thing, you know. So, uh, you know, we all got together and Brian flew out from Minnesota and, and, uh, you know, we went to, uh, went to the symposium and, um, I'm still just trying to figure out what's going on, you know, with this whole thing. And man, I'm telling that's where I met Bob Gimlin and John Green. Um, you know, I mean, there was a lot of, a lot of people there who are still big names in the, in the business today, you know? And um, after that, we uh, we went and camped a couple of nights up at Bluff Creek. Uh, thought it would be cool to do. So we went up and visited the film site and camped at Laos Camp. And um, so 
you know, just, it just sort of, that's where I met Kathy. Kathy was a presenter there. I met her and uh, we started dating and uh, I had read all of her reports on the BFRO. She was a member of the BFRO at that time. And, and she got me involved in the BFRO and uh, she was a curator and I became an investigator and a curator with the BFRO and, you know, went on a couple of their very first expeditions that they gave and up in the Redwoods and up in the Olympic Peninsula and out here in California. And, um, it just sort of, it's just, <laughs> it just sort of happened, you know? I, I mean, I wasn't really, you know, but I, I, I tell people, you know, a lot of people say, well, do you believe in Bigfoot? And I said, well, I, I don't really have a choice to believe in Bigfoot, <laughs> yeah. you know? Um, you know, I, I, I come from a, a little bit different aspect than most people who get into you know, researching Bigfoot, I, I don't say I'm a, you know, knower versus believer or whatever that it's just a part of my reality. You know, um, I don't, I don't have to be convinced. Um, I mean, I know they're real. Um, I've seen them. I've watched them. Um, you know, I know that there's, there's something out there that's bipedal and it's covered in fur and it can do some amazing things and, um, you know, and that's, and you know what the process of elimination, that's the only thing it could be, you know, and it's, it's sort of, it's just sort of where I'm at now. Um, you know, I, I, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's just, like I said, it's, it's, it's part of my reality. It's, you know, I didn't go looking for Bigfoot, you know, Bigfoot found me. And, uh, you know, I don't know whether it's a blessing or it's a curse, but it helped me meet Kathy and best thing that ever happened to me, you know, she's, and she's very knowledgeable and, um, you know, and, and through that made some really good friends. And, um, that's sort of, um, those friendships and experiences. And we, we started researching, of course, on our own. Um, you know, our dates when we were, when we were dating before we got married. And of course, even after we got married, you know, our, our dates were Bigfoot related. Uh, <laughs> she had, you know, we, she, right after I met her in Willow Creek, uh, she had, um, helped facilitate the recording of the Tahoe scream up in Tahoe. And she had a research area there at, uh, Lake Tahoe. And she took me up there. And we had some amazing experiences there as well. And um, it's where I met, the, um, I met some more, you know, great people there. And um, it's just sort of, it's just, it just sort of, it, it, it took off. And, um, you know, I, she and I got out of the BFRO. Um, it wasn't really something that, um, uh, something that really worked out uh, well for us, um, you know, for a lot of different reasons, but you know, that's neither here nor there, but we did meet people like uh, Alton Higgins and um, Daryl Collier. And, um, and of course, Brian Brown was a member of the, at the time it was called the Texas Bigfoot Research Center and then became the Texas Bigfoot Research Conservancy. And then, we uh, they invited us to come out and um, in Oklahoma they had some they had some uh, experiences uh, in an area that they had been researching in Oklahoma and um, they they wanted our um, our opinion and that's what it was and that's how we ended up going to Oklahoma was was by invitation. And uh, we spent uh, probably the most eventful week of our lives there. The very first time we went to, uh, you know, to what's known as Area X and um, came out of that week um, basically with PS, PTSD. <laughs> uh, how many years? I mean, I'm not trying to tell anybody what to do. <laughs> but for right. years I have said, to people out in the Pacific Northwest, especially, 
come to Oklahoma, the haystack is a lot smaller. Oh, it is. A lot smaller. Absolutely. And you end up in situations that are crazy. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. I, I concur wholeheartedly. Again, growing up in Texas, in West Texas, I grew up out in Abilene, and my exposure to to Oklahoma had only been on the western side of Oklahoma, and I thought, you know, there, there's no way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bigfoot. That's is just more of the Texas Panhandle. What are you talking about? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just yeah. There's there's a barbed wire fence. It's yeah. the only difference. <laughs> and, and you know, flat plains and all that. Um, and I had never really had never really been to um, southeastern Oklahoma. And for those people that are listening who have never been to southeast Oklahoma, um, it's 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 a, it's a different environment. It's um, it's much like Arkansas. Yeah. So if you've been to Arkansas and you've been to Western Arkansas, it's basically the you know real close to what it's like in Southeast Oklahoma. It's primitive, and began researching um, uh, uh, Southeast Oklahoma. It has uh, the second highest rainfall uh, in the continental United States uh, annual annual rainfall. And uh, of course, it, it doesn't compare to the Pacific Northwest because you know that gets a, an enormous amount of rainfall there. But Southeast Oklahoma is real close, and that means lush green uh, vegetation. But at the same time, it's a completely different environment. It is not the uh, the, the fast growing you know soft woods conifers that you find in, um, in, in Washington and Oregon. It's, you know, hardwood forest. It is, you know, it, oh, and everything there is trying to kill you, by the way. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, if you want to, if you want to go, if you want to go somewhere to have the environment kill you and consume you, Southeast Oklahoma is your ticket. Yeah. Um, because it is unforgiving. And, um, and something else I didn't know uh, that uh, Washita's uh, are the oldest mountain range um, in North America, um, and they uh, they go uh, they are oriented east and west, uh, as opposed to most all the other uh, mountain ranges in in North America that are oriented north south. And uh, they are highly eroded, so there's a lot of bedrock, and so which makes the the uh, terrain uh, very inhospitable. Uh, in other words, there's a lot of exposed rock, but the greenbrier and the poison ivy don't care, Mm-mm. and it covers everything. And um, so, oh, and it's a perfect environment for every venomous snake uh, in North America. Love it there. And um, so, you know, so you'll find all of that. Very primitive, very Jurassic, Jurassic like. And you don't have to be very far from a paved road before you are in the thick. And, and you can, anybody who's been in the Pacific Northwest knows you can walk 20 feet off of a paved road and you can be completely unseen from the roadway. It's so thick. Much the same in Southeast Oklahoma. So it's a perfect environment uh, for, you know, for for the Bigfoot creatures. And, uh, uh, and of course, you know, uh, with the uh, North American Wood Ape Conservancy, who Kathy and I are members of, you know, we could, we call them wood apes, and it's, it's basically it's, and that's probably more descriptive than Bigfoot. You know, Bigfoot has a connotation of a big, you know, friendly creature that you know that you know Harry and the Hendersons right. and, and all that. But the temperament of these creatures in Southeast Oklahoma is not friendly. Um, they're, they're, they're not, uh, they're not your friend. Um, you may want them to be, but they don't want to be your friend. 
And, uh, and, and I can understand why, because if I had to live in that environment, I'd be pretty cranky too. All the time. Um, yeah, totally. hundred <laughs> percent. But yeah, no, they're there. Oh yeah. Oh, the, oh, they're there. And have been for a long time. It's part of the culture in Southeast Oklahoma and Arkansas as well. You know, it's, it's, you know, people don't really talk about it so much. The locals don't. Um, you know, why would they? You know, uh, and, and for people that are uh, not familiar with the, the culture in, in, you know, Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Louisiana area, th- those people, the locals, they don't really give a, give a dang what you think. They don't. No. Um, you know, and but they're also not the uh, uh, you know going to go out and go out of their way to try and you know convince you you know what's real and what's not. You know, it's it's up to you you know to to make your own determination and and uh, yeah. So we were very fortunate to to find our way through all these experiences and happenstances. To end up, um, you know, researching Southeast Oklahoma, and it, it's 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 different when you research um, when you research these animals in Southeast Oklahoma. It's different. It's different than when you do it out here um, on the West Coast. It, it's a a completely different methodology, and um, you know they're they're not as vocal for one thing. Um, in in Oklahoma, the, they're not. They don't really need to, which leads you to believe that their vocalizations, um, you know, probably more for you know locating others, or a, a, a communication of some sort. And when you're in a closer environment like Southeast Oklahoma. They do vocalize, and they do, I mean, I won't say that they have a language. Uh, I'm not ready to make that leap, but I will say that they, they do communicate. They do interact with each other, but they're being a lot closer. They can do it in different ways. They don't have to scream and holler to do it. Um, you know, and um, I, I was fortunate enough to, to, uh, to, to meet uh, someone that um, is an audi- audiologist, and there's a paper on a, on our on our website, which is uh, uh, woodape.org. That's woodape.org, which is North America Wood Ape Conservancy. That uh, you know uh, has offered a, a lot of um, um, you know a, a brain trust of uh, people that have gotten together and of uh, members of this organization and and those that are involved um, in the phenomenon as as well, um, you know, start to try to answer a lot of the questions like, like a big question that I had um, early on was, you know, how come we don't get these things on game camera? You know, what is it about a game camera? Well, why not? You know, you know, well, for one thing, it's kind of like a you know, hit and miss proposition. You got a game camera and covers a very small area and, you know, something has to come right in front of it in order to get a picture. But if we, and the North America, the, the group had a, had a multi-year um, project going on, um, to where they had put out uh, lots of these game cameras of all sorts in in this area that we research in now and never got in a picture of anything other than bear and deer and the other local fauna. And, you know, I mean, I'm an inquisitive type and I, I'm wondering, well, you know, let's, let's go by the process of elimination. Is there anything about a game camera that um, that these things would avoid, and of course, sight would be one of them. But you know, sounds. You know, what are the you know, what are your senses to where they could sense these things? Sight, sound, and I thought, okay, well, you know, do these things you know emit any kind of a sound that they could hear? 
And, and so in, in researching that, I reached out to uh, an audiologist um, with the University of Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, uh, Martin Leinert, uh, Dr. Martin Leinert, and I um, asked him, I said, you know, um, without telling him what was going on, I said, you know, I've, I've got these game cameras and we're just trying to figure out if they admit a sound. You know, is, is there any way I can test them? And he said, well, you can send one to me and I'll test it for you. And I thought, okay. So we boxed one up. We sent it off to him and he put it in his lab and got his graduate students on it. And he came back and said, we, this particular game camera anyway, the one we sent him, emitted no sound whatsoever. Not any, not, inf not infrasound, not ultrasound, nothing. No audible sound, human audible sound. And uh, I said, okay, well, thanks. And he, he said, well, let me ask you, why are you asking this? And I said, well, you know, um, and here it goes. <laughs> here and we I go. Told him, <laughs> and he told me, he goes, man, why didn't you say so? Uh, he goes, he grew up in New Jersey and in the Pine Barrens, and he had experiences in the Pine Barrens. Wow. And, and uh, so he wrote a paper for us, and it's on the page about uh, vocalizations of primates. And in his um, findings, his estimation, his opinion, uh, was that primates, uh, if they make a vocalization, it's emotional response. It's not like they sit there and they're going to tell a story, and they consciously emit uh, you know, uh, sounds, it's emotion. It's like, it's like a, a toddler. I've got a three year old granddaughter and you give her a piece of candy or an ice cream and she squeals. That's an emotional response. Right. Right. And so that would be uh, the same with these creatures. So their, uh, vocalizations are an emotional response. So that was something that, that I found, you know, very interesting. And uh, so when we talk about communications, um, you got to, if, if you put it in that context, then, you know, them having a language is probably not something that it would become developed because it, they don't need it. You know, uh, it's not something that, that, that does them any good. Um, it's just something that is inherent in them that they that they scream that they vocalize so the screams that i heard uh, in the trinity wilderness and and in the sierras here were you know like e excitement or uh pleasure or um our uh, irritation or you know they're trying to to locate uh one another through these vocalizations now they do that in the in the Washita's as well. Um, they they do uh, like communicate in a method that is, and we've heard uh, mouth pops are uh, real big, and one that we call uh, 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 like like croaks, like like a frog croaking uh, or clicking. Um, but and of course rock tapping and um and 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 the wood knocks as well and you know we've we've tried to discern what all of those are and you know we i mean we're not 100 percent sure um on any of those i mean there's no way you really can be but um uh but we've we have had uh, these um, um, mouth pops, and and when I say mouth pops, you know there are different varieties of mouth pops, you know, and the ones that uh, are most unsettling are it's like a it's like a a a, a talk, like Cliff Bergman does it really good. It's like we put your tongue to the top of your the roof of your mouth and you pop it down, and uh, more like a uh, you know, talking, talking mm -hmm. sound. And, um, we've, we've heard that we've heard all of those, 
And, and of course, the, what we call the faux speech or the, you know, samurai chatter, you know, whatever you want to call it. You know, we've heard a lot of instances uh, of that as well. And uh, <laughs> one real unsettling is that uh, after being there, and Kathy and I have spent, um, um, you know, multiple weeks there uh, at times. Uh, you know, like we'll go and have gone uh, for like three weeks at a time. And after being there a while, you know, <laughs> when you're out in the woods and, and, and you've, you know, you've been interacting with other humans. And of course, my name is Bob. And if you go out there in the woods and you're all by yourself and you know, there's nobody else around and you hear, Hey Bob. Hey Bob. <laughs> hey Bob. <laughs> and you're like looking around. It's like there's nobody here but me. <laughs> it's that can be a little unsettling, you know. So um, we think that you know, of course, you know, mimicry is probably comes into play there, but. Uh, Yes. So it's, it's offered us the ability to the opportunity to, to try out um, a lot of different things. And I'm sorry if I'm just rambling on. No, and I'm just, just, I'm just taking it all in. I mean, uh, (laughs) you know, I, I just like hearing the stuff. I love hearing your thoughts on the stuff. Uh, You know, I, I, I have a lot of witnesses on this show. Uh, People hear a lot of different stories. And I know that there's probably people listening to your story and, you know, whenever you start, you know, kind of poo-pooing on a few things a little bit, uh, you know, there's some people who are listening are going to be like, well, of course they have a language. We already know that they have a language. Why does th- this guy doesn't know they have a language? I want everybody to understand that. Bob, you're part of an actual research group <laughs> that's, that's actually conducting research. Right. And uh, you guys tackle things one at a time and try to figure them out. You don't put the cart before the horse in any situation. So speculation is kind of off the table in this scenario other than coming up with possible solutions and reasons to things that you guys encounter out there. If Right. Would I be correct in that <laughs> assertion? You would. You would be. You would be. Um, and I think that's that is the, the, the probably the greatest favor any person can do um, for themselves in trying to research these animals is don't have any preconceived notions. Okay, uh, because we had the preconceived notion. I know I did. The first time I went there, I thought this is going to be a snap. This will be no problem whatsoever. You know, we're going to go in there, going to be a done deal. Uh, hello, no. Yeah. Uh, How many years all. later are we? <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's right now. It's twenty. Wow. Uh, yeah, well, oh, I'm sorry that we've been going to uh, uh, Oklahoma. It's ten years. But uh, but 20 years since I met Kathy and I was uh, been re- really researching this. But you know, um, getting in the yeah, well, what it comes down to is you is is you is is you like try something and we'll, we'll and that's uh, one of the great things about this group is that we're able to go in there and we're able to if we want to try to do let's say an experiment. Uh, as it is, as it were, we have the ability to do it over the entire summer, over like a three to four month period, because anybody who's not familiar with the North American Wood Ape Conservancy, what our deal is, is that we have um, uh, land that's available to us. I mean, it's private land, and it is in the heart of the Washita Mountains. And um, it is uh, off the grid. There is no running water except for a creek and uh, no electricity um, and very, very limited cell service. It's spotty at best and generally not available. So when you go into our research area, uh, you're, you're going back in time. 
And uh, so you're kind of uh, left to your own wits. And um, so to try, uh, we'll try and figure like the same way that I was telling you about the game cameras. Um, all right, so uh, so that was one aspect was the sound emissions. And if we're fairly convinced that these things don't create a sound, not enough. If any of them do, it's not enough to be a deterrent. So there are other things, visual. All right, so we would camouflage uh, cameras. I mean, we would uh, hide them inside. We would take tree bark, you know, big sections of tree bark, hollow it out, you know, put a camera inside, and, uh, you know, just a, just an opening just big enough for a lens to poke through and adhere it to a tree and not with straps or anything like that. So it became an actual part of the tree if you were to look at it on first glance. And so we're trying to hide it that way. And, uh, uh, and we, we still don't get anything. Um, you know, now, these cameras are triggered by an IR emitter, and so, you know, motion detector. And so that was one of the things that we were trying to, you know, try and figure out, well, what is it about the IR? And, you know, one of the mistakes that we made um, early on is that uh, we had, um, well, initially we had availability to a, a cabin. Uh, and this cabin is an ancient cabin, and it, um, well, not ancient, no, it's not primitive, but might as well be primitive. It's off the grid, no, no water or no electricity or anything, and it was a pretty old cabin, been there for a long time, and very rarely used. And so we set up our base of operations in that for several years, and we thought, you know, these things are coming around uh, and slapping the side of the cabin at night. I mean, and slapping it hard. I mean, hard enough so dust would fall off the ceiling when you're in there laying in bed. And bam! And you get up and go outside and run around, nothing <laughs> quiet. You know, and so it's maddening is what it is. So we came up with a bright idea. Well, let's put up a security system, security cameras. And so we had to put up solar panels on the roof for a battery bank and got, you know, a, you know uh, the system that would record all night long. We had eight cameras and we put them all around the place and we never got anything. Never. And if we would turn the thing on, we would have no activity whatsoever. If, if our security system was turned on, we ended up calling, and there would be nothing happen. We ended up calling it the ape shield. If you wanted to get a good night's sleep, you turn on the ape shield. And just turn on the outdoor cameras, the outdoor security cameras, and nothing, absolutely guaranteed nothing would happen. And so we started, and, and so we took pictures of the thing, uh, of the security system, uh, with cameras and IR cameras uh, at night um, to see in the daytime and at night to see if we could see if we could see any difference. And at night, you could barely see uh, because these were IR cameras, so that they would record, you know, in the dark. And you could barely see a very faint discernible um, IR glow from the emitters. And so we figured that that's probably what it was. So if we could see it, and especially on IR camera, that maybe the apes could see it as well. One thing we started doing was, uh, as we figured out, well, we, we would use thermal imagers as well. And one of the things we figured out that it, that an IR, I mean, a thermal imager will see through black plastic if it's thin enough like a garbage bag, like one of those hefty garbage bags. And we would slit them open and we would stretch them over a window. Or it's over, we wrapped an entire tent frame, you know, a canopy, a pop-up canopy in these uh, black plastic bags. 
and you can sit, we would sit inside it all night long. Oh my God. You talk about a sensory deprivation chamber. Wow. Right? Spend a few <laughs> nights in that. Yeah. It's like you're ready to, you're talking to yourself by the end of the night. And, um, and nothing would happen. Um, um, we, right after we first put it up, we did see a couple of encroachments, but they were very, but they were checking out, they were clearly checking out the tent, you know, our, our canopy, but not getting close enough to really get any kind of a good, any kind of a good visual on them, but you could tell that they were there. They were, they were in the area and they were checking us out. And, and then it got to be to where if somebody was inside there at night, they would throw rocks at the tent. And we thought, all right, well, they're seeing us get inside the tent. So we would, like, make this big, huge diversion, and we would send people out in all directions and try and drive them back so somebody could sneak in there, and you'd sneak in there. You'd sit in there quiet and light discipline, no lights, no sound allowed in there at all. And still they would bust you, and, and they would throw rocks. And some of them were really big rocks, too, not little pebbles. I mean, we had a, we have a trauma surgeon that uh, was in there one night, and he got a, a, a rock about the size of a football, barely missed his head. Oh, man. And so they're like, how, 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 how? You know, so we started thinking. And, uh, and we come up with these ideas, and we try and test them, and then you see where it goes. And then you try to make some kind of a conclusion from that. And, of course, we can't prove this, but it is my opinion that that these apes can see at least a little bit into the IR spectrum, into the infrared spectrum. They have great night vision. Maybe not, you know, perfect, but certainly better than ours. And I, I don't think anybody can dispute that. And... And my theory, or hypothesis, is that if they can see into the IR the spectrum, that's what thermal images are doing. They're seeing into the IR spectrum, and they're seeing through black plastic. That if we can see out using the IR uh, infrared spectrum, that maybe they can see in through uh, using the IR spectrum. So that's the case. And if someone is sitting inside of a tent wrapped in black plastic, thin enough for a thermal imager to see through it, it's possible that they can see you inside there because they can see into the IR spectrum as well. IR is there. It's there. It's, it's in the environment. And um, if they can see into it, then maybe they can see through the black plastic uh, just the same way we can using a thermal imager. And if that's the case, you're not going to fool them. We clearly have not fooled them using that. And when we're not out there and we're not in it, they come around. If they're not, if and we call it the overwatch tent, and if nobody's in the overwatch tent, and the ape shield, the security system was not turned on. They came up and they they encroached upon the cabin. And if somebody was in the Overwatch tent or the or the our cameras were on, they did not. So, I mean, that kind of you're starting to eliminate the usefulness of uh, of a game camera. You know, I mean, it, it's <laughs> if they can see the light. And, and if, you, if you've ever looked uh, using, especially night vision, uh, at a game camera, when it goes off, oh, it looks like a tail light on a Ford pickup, right. you know, uh, brake light, it bright, it's bright, it's really bright, you know, so now, you know, you're starting to think, well, what are you supposed to do, you know, I mean, it, it, these things are incredibly adapt to their environment. And uh, so, which is one reason why they have remained elusive, you know, for so long. And, and so that first week that we were there, we had uh, quite a few really uh, amazing experiences. And, um, and, 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 you know, if, 
if when you're reading reports, witness reports, if you'll like, like pay attention to the minute details and start, you know, piece and start connecting the dots of all of those. Um, like, like their ability to hide, their ability to climb trees. Um, you know, these, all of these things start to fall, all, all these pieces of the puzzle start to fall into place. Like there's a report that I read many years ago about a guy watching um, uh, a Bigfoot creature in the Pacific Northwest. And he was watching through a clear cut across, across a canyon, and he sees something he thought was a, a, a man, you know, ended up probably being a Bigfoot. Um, and long before this human ever heard the sound of this truck coming down this dirt road, the creature obviously detected it, heard it. So it's really great hearing. And it flattened down behind the log until the truck passed. And then it got up. When the truck was passed, it got up and walked on its way. Now, I paid very little attention to that detail, but it came into play that first week that we went in to, uh, to, to, uh, to Area X. And uh, we had an occurrence, and there were five of us there. And uh, um, they were using a distraction technique to where, uh, um, and all this activity really ramps up, uh, you know, in about an hour or so before sunset. And, you know, which is when deer activity starts to ramp up as well. And, um, and we were hearing these, these sounds, these rocks impacting uh, this metal, the metal roof of a, of a shed off, on the, off to the west and one off to the east. And clearly rocks hitting this roof. Bam, 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 as it rolls off. And we would all run over there and then way back on the other end of the little compound. Bam, 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 we'd all run over there. <laughs> then bam, we all run over there. It's like the, you know, a clown show. We're going back and forth. And Kathy went, no, you know what? I'm going to stay right here in the middle. And she's just, she just planted herself right in the middle of everything. And she said, I'm going to see if I can see or hear anything when you guys, as you guys are running around like crazy guys. And, uh, and she's there and she's looking down this, down this trail and she sees a branch on a tree uh it didn't snap down and back up it moved down slowly and it moved back up slowly and she you know as as we're going back and forth from one end to the other she stops me and she goes hang out here for a second and let those guys go over there and uh she goes that tree right there, I've been watching it. That clump of trees. She goes, I think there's something in there. Go check that out. And so, you know, went over there, this clump of trees, and I stick my head in there. And it was like a little ditch, like a little drainage ditch, a little depression there. And I had this had this fallen fallen tree out in the trail. You had to walk around the tree to get down the trail. And I walked around this dead tree, this fallen tree, and I stuck my head in there and I'm looking around, you know, and I'm looking and I could see through to the other side and I could see the hillside and I could see a game trail going up there and I didn't see anything. And I came back and I said, you know, there's, there's nothing in there. And she goes, well, I've been watching it. It didn't leave. And I said, well, there's a game trail leads directly away, from, you know, from the backside. Something could have escaped, you know, that way. And she's like, hmm, I don't know. I don't think so. And I thought, well, you know, I didn't see anything, you know. There again, my preconceived notion, I'm looking for a patty, you know, Harry and the Henderson, some big creature standing there. And, but when I had stuck my head in there, I had, um, I thought, well, you know, I could get to the other side of this little clump of trees. I could like walk on this dead, this fallen tree and I could like, and I look down and I see a little ditch and it looks like a couple of, you know, uh, uh, dead logs down there in that ditch. And I thought, hmm, I could like put one foot here, one foot there and I could Daniel Boone it across, you know, I thought, nah. You know, I've only been there about three days. I don't want to, you know, hurt myself and you know, twist an ankle or something like that. 
Besides, there was no need. You know, I could see through the other side. And so I didn't really give it any more thought. And then we came back and we're sitting down and Ken uh, is, uh, we're documenting everything thoroughly. And so he's got the video recorder and he's interviewing each of us. What did you hear? What did you hear? What did you hear? What did you do? What did you do? We're documenting everything. And then we hear crunch, crunch, crunch. And Kathy turns and looks and there's two of these wood apes walking along the bottom of the hillside coming from right where she had just seen the, the branches move and they're coming towards uh, this little woodshed that was out behind this old cabin and she goes oh my god there they are and she jumps up the trooper that she is she ran right at him <laughs> right Full at sprint, him right at him you know and uh, uh, ran past the, uh, the, uh, the the game camera, which caught her own game camera. Um, <laughs> but it didn't catch the wood apes. They hadn't gotten close enough to it yet. And, you know, they stopped. And, and four of us got a, an amazing view of them. It was brief, but there was a bigger one in front. There was a smaller one right behind it. And the bigger one stopped and turned around and like went bam, like, like they bumped into each other. Like, you know, kind of like the Keystone cops. They stood there for a second and kind of went, Oh shit. And boom, they shot up that hillside, very steep hillside. Like it was nothing, man. I mean, gliding. I mean, like they were snapped up on a bungee cord. It was amazing. The big one ran up on two legs held its uh, arms against its chest and splayed its feet out sideways and went doo, 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 right up that hill. And the other one went down on all fours and there was a, a fallen smaller diameter tree and used it like a ladder and ran up that thing all the way to the top of the hill. And it, they were, boom, gone. Solid black, dark, no, you know, no discernible you know, other markings on it at all. We were close enough to see the face, but it was too dark. I mean, the, their faces were too dark and they were in the shadow. So, I mean, it, that night was, that night was chaos. I mean, we saw uh, glowing eyes on the hill. I heard what sounded like a 500 pound squirrel run up a tree. Uh, we had more rocks. We had cabin slaps. I mean, it was like, you know, uh, it was like World War III all night long. We were exhausted the next day. So the next morning, we get up, and Ken, who had videotaped us, he goes, Bob, he goes, you told us about going over there and checking out this clump of trees. Let, let me, let me, you know. Let me film you when you go walk us through what you did. And I went back over there and I said, I look and, and I'm looking here and I see this dead tree and I and I pushed the branches away and I thought, you know, I could I could cruise through to the other side if I step on this log, then I step on one of those down there and I look down there and those two logs that were in the ditch that I had seen the day before were now gone. So I stood six, eight feet away from these two wood apes that they had the discipline to lay down in that ditch and let me almost step on them. I've told this story on the show before. You and I have never discussed it. But there was a time uh, where virtually the exact same thing happened to me. Really? I was in a scenario where there was a fallen tree, and I was, it was... Uh, beyond dusk, I mean, just barely visible. Uh, I didn't have a flashlight or anything like that. Activity was going on at the time, and that's why I was in this position. But there is a large uh, fallen tree, and then on the back side of that tree, it looked like uh, that real tall, you know, I don't know what kind it is, you know, I'm sure you've seen it before down here, like, Basically, hay, you know, tall grass. Right. And it was, sure. the grass was dead, you know, and it was kind of humped over the back of this fallen tree. Uh, and it looked kind of weird. It looked kind of out of place and everything. And I had a big walking stick with me, 
uh, that I just took with me everywhere because, as you said, everything's trying to kill yeah. you here. <laughs> right. And I thought for a second, just the brief impulse just to poke it with my stick, but I didn't. And I just <laughs> went on. And then a few minutes later, uh, I meet up with the guy that I was out there with, and we go walking back down that trail by that log. And as we walk up to the log, I can't help but notice on the back side of that log, it's completely empty all the way to the ground. There is no large pile of dead grass growing up over it or anything. And the only thing I can come up with is that was the Bigfoot that was messing with us that night. And it was, like you said, had the discipline to just lay there up against that log perfectly still. And what would have happened if I had poked it with the stick? <laughs> just like what would have happened yeah. if you said, you know, I, I'm going to go ahead and <laughs> step on that log down there. Yeah. 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 Well, we might not be talking right now. Yeah. If either one of us had done that, who knows? That's just crazy that they'll just do that sort of thing though. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It is. It is. They're amazing, amazing creatures, masters of their environment. And people say, oh, why don't you see one? Well, you know what? They don't want you to see them. And your brain doesn't see them. Right. You know, your brain, your brain, just like you, you saw grass, I saw logs. Yeah. Right? That's what we're up against. We're not only combating the uh, abilities and intellect of these creatures, but you're also battling your own brain. And it's something you have to reconcile. Have you noticed any differences between their behavior here and their behavior in the Pacific Northwest? Well, of course, I think that the biggest difference is their vocalizations. They vocalize out here on the West Coast much more than they do down there in Southeast Oklahoma. Um, because of the distances are right. so they're, they're like you say, it's a, it's a, it's a bigger haystack out here. Yeah. They are more separated, uh, and more easily separated, uh, out here. Um, you know, they have a, a much bigger yard, uh, territory, their, their playground is much larger. So in order to, uh, you know, to locate each other, then, you know, the vocalizations, that's where the vocalizations come in handy. But, um, uh, I mean, other, other than, other than that, I'd say they're, they're probably, and I, maybe their temperament in, in, uh, Southeast Oklahoma is a little more, you know, obstinate, a little more cranky, um, than, than, uh, than out here and and they may grow they may grow taller uh larger um you know, it's like any animal in their environment they will grow to as big as they need to be or you know within reason um you know for for their for their environment i mean that's why giraffes have long necks because they eat stuff that's really high um you know they didn't start out with long necks they just didn't evolve that way um so, you know, they, I, I, I mean, I've had, I've been, I've been stalked out here. I've, I've heard, um, I've heard the, the samurai talk out here. Um, deer hunting a lot, you know, I, I generally, when I deer hunt, I like to go to the very edge of the wilderness area to where it's easy for me to get to, but yet it's in, a, in an area that is, that the that the game feels safer, and the wilderness area has a lot fewer people in it, and and so, um, you know they'll they'll I think they'll 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 come in closer, um, probably in Oklahoma they'll probably come in closer because they need to to be able to see you. I think they're very curious and they want to see you, and they want to observe you. And in, the, and in the Sierras is more open than even in, uh, say, the Olympic Peninsula is very dense, you know, but we've had, they're very similar behaviors, you know, from, from, from one to the other, so. Stick formations. 
do you put any credence in those? Are you finding them in Area X? What are your thoughts? Uh, well, I mean, I'll tell you, I've never been a big, uh, had, I had never been uh, a, a big uh, supporter of the stick formations. I, I really couldn't understand why they would do that. Um, because they're, you know, if you think about it, it's like, well, it's a landmark. Well, my God, you know, it's like 400 million acres. How are you going to find the landmark in that? They're probably better off in, in memorizing the terrain than they are any kind of a of stick formation. I, and this is my own opinion. I think that uh, any stick formations, if they are legitimate, they're probably the work of juveniles because they don't have toys and it's probably something for them to do. I can't see an adult spending the time and energy, you know, resources in creating a stick formation in something that really isn't going to do them you know, any good. But I can see, I could definitely see juveniles doing that. Now, um, we did have an, uh, uh, however, that being said, here in the Sierras, we do put a lot of stock in broken trees because uh, um, I, I've, I've seen many broken trees that are very similar diameter trees broken about the same height. Now, I realize bear can break trees. You know, cubs will climb to the top of a thin tree and they'll bend over and it'll snap. But when you get a tree that has been apparently snapped and maybe twisted, you know, you got to pay a little more attention to that. And when they're all about the same height, um, you have to pay attention to that as well. You know, I've seen a line of broken trees. Kathy and I followed a line of like 20 broken trees in a direct line from uh, a, a mountainside down to the water and they are in a perfect line. That's not natural. And humans didn't do that. And a bear cub is not going to do 20 of them in a <laughs> row, you know? Yeah. So there is something to be said, but I will tell you in, in area X, I, no, we don't see, we don't see uh, uh, stick formations in area X. However, we did have a spot to where uh, we had an observation uh, point that was in a creek bed, and uh, we had a member get bluff charged there. And again, this mouth talking was going back and forth on either side of him. And uh, then he had got a bluff charge. And um, it, this is a, a, an observation point that we had set up and was used over a multi week period, which is probably. In retrospect, not something you want to do because they're going to, they're smart. They're going to key in on that. If you're going to use an observation post, use it for a day or two and then be gone, you know, and do it as natural as possible. Don't use any artificial type, you know, things like a, like a blind and deer blind and you know, any of that kind of stuff because they're going to clue in on that right away. They're really smart. Uh, but he was sitting in uh, a deer blind behind some manufactured, you know, paneling, a ghost blind, you know, those mirrored panels. And uh, he got the mouth talking on either side of him, and he got blood charged. And so we went up there the next day to try and, and find some tracks or any evidence. And coming from the backside, which is really dense, I found an X with marked with sticks that were not trees that were broken there. They were brought there about the diameter of a baseball bat, about 10 feet long X uh, each, and had created an X. And in the crook of this X was another stick, was about eight, eight foot long stick, and it was perfectly balanced in the crook of that X. And you could touch it with your finger, and it would teeter-totter back and forth. It did not happen natural. I'm not saying humans didn't do it, but I don't understand why a human would do something like that. It would take a lot of time to do that. So, but if from the location of that X, you could look down 
the hill and you could observe from above that observation post. So, I mean, I am not going to discount that they could be used to mark something. I don't know that they're, I don't know that we have enough information, let me put it that way, to be able to correlate what those might mean or that all of them, you know, and once finding Love, Cliff, and Bobo, brothers of mine, love them to death, but ever since that show came on, you almost can't trust anything out in the forest anymore because everybody's seen that. Everybody does, does strict stick structures, you know, humans will do it. It's all along the Appalachian Trail, you know, all these little teepees of sticks. And, uh, and vocalizations, hollers and hooting and hollering and all that kind of stuff. You know, so it's kind of put the kibosh a little bit on those types of things. So, uh, um, you know, it's, it's really, like I say, if you will go out and research these things and keep an open mind, and rather than seeing a stick structure and immediately assume that it's Bigfoot, you will have to start doing some detective work and think, how close to a trail is it? How close to humans, you know, could it be? Uh, do you see any other things that would lead you to believe that they're not human caused, you know, you know, created by humans? And so you have to kind of like, you have to be a little bit skeptical. Uh, the skeptics love to think that they're the smartest humans on earth. You know what I mean? Oh, but, yeah. And, we, but, we both but know they, one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> one or two. <laughs> <laughs> yes. At least. At least, yes. And, uh, and, and good people. I'm sure they're uh, great people. You know what I mean? But... But by the same token that 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 people are uh, fervent about everything being Bigfoot, there are just as many people about uh, skeptics saying nothing is Bigfoot. And you know what? Neither one of them are right. right. It's somewhere in the middle. So um, you know, it's uh, you know, it's it's, it's something you're gonna have to, you have to you have to be a de a, a, a detective. And, you know, before we get too far gone, I, I do want to I do want to encourage people to uh, to please visit the North American Wood Ape Conservancy uh, website at woodape.org and see some of the research and the work that we've done. We're continuing to do it. We're not giving up. We may change our method methodology as time goes by. We try to adapt, you know, uh, our methods and uh, try and and try to do everything we can. Um, one of the a couple of the big things that I think that the group has accomplished uh, is uh, number one, we've put out a research paper uh, and, and documenting the first four years that we were in Area X uh, doing this long term study um, uh, uh, called the. Uh, uh, Washita Project Monograph, the OPM. It's, 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 you can download it for free. It's not a short read, it's a couple of hundred pages, but it's free. And it, it documents with uh, sounds, uh, recordings, uh, uh, photographs, and a um, documentation of everything. And those were certainly the most active years. Uh, there, uh, you know, uh, wood ape activity was. And, and another thing that we have there is called the TAG 7 paper. It's a, a paper that we did um, on a uh, project that we had. We had uh, some great minds in our group, and we came up with a method of, uh, of placing a, um, attempting to put a radio transmitter tag on an animal. And we succeeded it on, in, in attaching a radio transmitter tag to an animal, some kind of animal. We go through and it's described in the paper of why we think it is a wood ape and not a bear or any other creature. And we track this 
um, radio transmitter. Um, it's used in wildlife, um, you know, uh, research all the time. It very it was this little nano tag, and it emits like a little inaudible beep. You can pick it up on a uh, directional radio. Um, uh, receiver with an antenna, directional antenna, and we tracked it for nine months till the battery went dead. And we tracked it over an area of, um, you know, like, you know, 40 square miles. And, and, and from that, able to deduce seasonal range, and it ended up making a complete loop. You know, and in the summertime uh, habitat area, in the wintertime, in the fall, in the spring, um, through all these areas, and and trying to, you know, figure out where the where at least this tag went through that nine months, and we were able to get quite a few radio hits. And we lost it immediately, right at first, when it was deployed. We described the methods, all the equipment that we use, um, and the methodology and tracking it, and with pictures and explanations. So if anybody wants to replicate that, they can. And we encourage everybody to do so. Um, you know, it's not easy. We lost it initially. We couldn't find it. We thought we were done, and we finally, through uh, uh, air search, uh, through a private plane, uh, doing a grid search, we were finally able to locate it several miles away. And then from there, we tracked it both in the air, on foot. We tried to track it down. We tried to chase it. We tried to move in with multiple teams, closing in on it. We are unable to do so, and it finally the battery went dead. But we did get a lot of data from it. So uh, that's tag seven. It was it was tag seven because we had eight tags out there, and that was the one that got deployed. Was number seven. I was a huge fan of that project, by the way. I thought that was. Oh, thank you. I thought it was brilliant, groundbreaking at the time for sure. Uh, what was the closest you got to the tag physically? Oh, uh, probably the first night was within a half a mile. Wow. And then uh, I was on a team, and we located it, and it was, we tracked it uh, going, it was fast. Let me tell you what, fast. Within a matter of just less than 10 minutes, it went from the bottom of a canyon all the way up the next ridge and over the top. And we could track it just because it's a, it's a directional antenna and you got to aim it. Right. And I was on a ridge and we located it way down at the bottom. And within 10 minutes, we had tracked it all the way up and it disappeared over the ridge and we lost the signal. And that was probably half a mile, less, no, less, maybe a quarter mile, you know, um, so the, the thing is, you don't really know how close you are except by the strength of the signal. Right. Uh, oh, I, I take that back. No, actually, they did get within a couple of hundred yards of it when we had uh, two teams out there on ATVs and with, uh, with the plane overhead. They were able to get certainly within a couple of hundred yards, but the thing was to move through the thickest, most inhospitable terrain possible and um good could never it just it it, it out distanced them like nothing it just it moved it was gone um but they got pretty close to it with that as well but was ne never able to get a visual on it have you guys thought about uh taking a modern stab at that same project using like drone technology or anything Yes, as a matter of fact, we, we, there's nothing. Let me put it this way. Nothing is off the table. Nothing except high explosives, which <laughs> I'm all in for. I'm in favor of. However, it's frowned upon. Um, but and other than other than that, other than napalm and uh, guided missiles, um, nothing is off the table. And, yeah, we have. Um, we have... Uh, uh, th uh, thermal drones. Uh, we have, um, yeah, definitely uh, drone technology. Um, uh, 
and we uh, have been just recently uh, discussing for this upcoming year uh, the the possibility of GPS uh, uh, recreating, and we've been trying Tag 7 again since then, and we haven't had any success. So if it was a bear, you know, then how come we didn't do it again? Right. Um, but but uh, there's lots of bear in the, um, the Washita's, but um, uh, with GPS tags, the problem with the GPS uh, locator tags is the size, um, and uh, also uh, it's not as simple as just like oh, you're gonna just like put a GPS you know tag on it, and you can find it anywhere in the world. No, you can't. Actually, it has to be uh, it. The, what the GPS tags do is they collect the data and then when it gets close enough to a receiver it will download the data but it has to come back to the receiver or you have to get close enough with the receiver in order for it to download the data so it doesn't give you real time um, you know, uh, there are there are uh, GPS uh, devices out there that do that, but they're the size of a pack of cigarettes. You know, it's right. not the size of a uh, marble, which is like what we used. Um, it, the, the technology is not there for that. If but, you could just yeah. get one to steal a cell phone from you. Oh, oh absolutely. No. Hey, I, I, I leave out, <laughs> no, I don't really, but I want to leave out like a carton of cigarettes and a bottle of Jack Daniels and get them <laughs> hooked and either give them liver or lung disease. Nice and soft. You know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Whatever, you know, I mean, hey. at least it was psilocybin, you know, but no, we try and be responsible. And, you know, that's, that's the constraints that we have. We are ethical, moral, uh, responsible researchers, and uh, so we do have we do have some constraints. <laughs> Science comes at a cost. I mean, it it does it does, and it it's going to take a body. I mean, bottom line, and I, and I know I, I've had you know people th literally threaten my life uh, for advocating the taking of a specimen, and, and and I'm sorry, it's the way it is. You know, I don't make the rules. You know, um, it's just it's just the way it is. Uh, you know, you want DNA. DNA comes somehow. And it doesn't. You don't get a wood ape to come up and spit in a bottle for you and send it off to Ancestry.com. It doesn't happen that way. If you want blood from an animal, you have to take blood from an animal. You know, if you want tissue from an animal, you have to take tissue from an animal. You know, and it's. It's just it's it's just the way it is, but it's not easy. Clearly, I've, we've been doing this for at least ten years in Area X, and we haven't proven it yet. We've come really close, but we're collecting a lot of good scientific data. In in fact, data that when whenever the thing is proven to be real, I believe that the North American Wood Ape Conservancy is going to be a go-to resource. You know, for uh, you know this data, and everybody that's out there uh, researching this animal, uh, I encourage you to do it in a scientific method, uh, and uh, and that whatever experiment that you you know put that you put out there, you do it so that it can be repeated and repeatable. Use a scientific method to do it. Um, you know, because it's one thing to be a hobbyist and I've got nothing against hobbyists. You want to go out there and hoot and holler and scream and have something scream back at you. And then, you, you know, you get scared and go home. That's great. That's fine. But it's not doing anything for the animal. You know, we need our, our uh, focus is to, first of all, prove the animal to be real. Second of all, to conserve it and its habitat, its resources. The, the, the North America is losing more than 5,000 acres of open space per day, per day. And not just through development, but also through fragmentation of their habitat. 
All right. If you, you imagine a, a big giant aquarium with fish in it, you know, that's great. That's great habitat. You can lose a sliver of that, but if it's right in the middle of it, now it becomes two aquariums. You have isolated two separate groups. Right. And that's what's happening in America today and through development and through, um, you know, and through deforestation. The Pacific Northwest, you can cut down 100,000 acres and it'll grow back in a few years. But what they cut down was conifers and conifers grow back. In Southeast Oklahoma, hardwood forest, nut bearing hardwoods, you know, that is an ecosystem. And when the timber companies come and they cut down all the walnut and, and, and hardwood, nut producing hardwoods and replant it with fast growing conifers for the cardboard industry, you know, God bless Amazon, but those cardboards, the cardboard boxes, you know, people don't poop them out. You know, they come from trees and they come from trees that are grown and, you know, in Southeast Oklahoma, unfortunately, is a big producer of uh, paper products. And um, so that's, you know, that's what we're trying to do is to conserve them and, you know, their habitat. And so if somebody really, really loves these animals and you want to save them, you want to save them, you, you need to, um, you know, do your research in a right way, something that is going to prove um, that those animals exist in that area. So document, document everything to the best of your ability, photographic, prints, sounds, audio, run audio from the minute you get out of your car, have an audio recorder in your pocket as soon as you get out of your truck, wherever it is, turn it on, set it on top of your truck, let it run the entire time until you leave, you know, photograph everything, measure everything, document it, record it, you know, write it down, keep diligent records, please. So with all that being said, is the group actively trying to harvest a specimen? Yes. Yes, we are. But it's not all we do. We do everything else, any possible means to document audio, visual, photographic, uh, everything, prints, hair, uh, everything, every single thing. But yes, and in, in, a, in a responsible way and adhering to the law. Um, and it is, and not just because you're in the group doesn't mean you uh, are approved uh, to be able to to carry a long uh, a long gun. Uh, it's not. We're not out there. You know, uh, we do it, and we have very strict, very strict, stringent rules, guidelines, rules of engagement, and uh, uh, protocols that we have to meet. And um, and it's and it doesn't happen with every team that goes out there. So it's it's actually fairly rare that someone uh, is out there trying to collect a specimen. Uh, so we don't all just show up with M16s and um, you know and go out there and shoot at everything that moves. We've taken very few shots, and there hasn't been a shot taken in several years. I was going to ask: Has there been? Uh, any close calls there has been yeah there has been and um um and and we learn a lot from the close calls as well and then that's including caliber um and ballistics um you know you uh need a weapon that is uh suitable for large game uh close range uh, and through be able to shoot uh, the, uh, uh, with a projectile that is not easily deflected. Such a horrible shooting environment. Oh, terrible. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. 12 gauge is not going to do it. No, I, 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 don't, I, I think people don't really realize what a difficult task it is to get a clean shot on one of these things in their environment, especially in the environment that we're talking about in southeastern Oklahoma. Uh, I mean, 
one limb in the way, the bullet's going to ricochet right off trajectory, yep. and it's pointless. Yep, yep, and that and that has happened, and that's why nobody uses thirty out sixes. Uh, the the weapon of choice is the forty five seventy. Um, you know, I mean, I have one of those. I also have a four fifty eight Winchester Magnum. Um, that uh, th- that is my preferred. But uh, after being there ten years, I uh, have have not taken a shot on target. Uh, not taking a shot at, at a target. I mean, at an animal. Uh, one more question, and then we'll get things wrapped up here. Uh, just out of curiosity, how did Area X come to be? Was this just, hey, let us look for Bigfoot here, or was there something going on there to begin with? Well, uh, well, there was something uh, going on there to begin with, but uh, we uh, clued in on it because we have some very intelligent members. And uh, Alton Higgins, who um, was our chairman emeritus, also uh, (laughs) was a speaker at the International Bigfoot Symposium in 2003 and a member of the BFRO, uh, lives in Oklahoma. And uh, he thought, you know, and he uh, spent some time in southeast Oklahoma. He goes, man, this is this area is really prime. And so he got out a map, and he said, if I was a Bigfoot, where would I be? And he checked out several areas and went to what is now the general area of Area X and found a mud hole. And uh, where water, you know, collects, you know, rains there quite a bit. And uh, found some prints, found some tracks. And uh, ended up meeting up with uh, someone who uh, had property in the area, um, got invited to the area, and had a history of uh, encounters with these creatures. And uh, this gentleman, his uh, motivation was the same as what ours are is through conservation and because of all the clear cutting that has been so prevalent all over southeast Oklahoma and um, changing the hardwood forest and changing the ecosystems into a conifer forest and uh, realized that that was going to negatively impact uh, this population and so you got invited um, uh, and that's how the uh, um, that's how he first uh, gained access to what is now Area X, and Area X got its name was because the Texas Bigfoot Group had three areas of operation. They called X, Y, and Z, and Y and Z did not pan out. One of which was the big thicket down in southern Texas, south southeast Texas. And none of those panned out to, for a multitude of reasons. And we ended up uh, being in Area X. And um, so it could have easily been called A, B, and C, or right. 1, 2, and 3, you know. And uh, it just sort of uh, evolved. There was a lot of activity and uh, getting in uh, friends with landowners there and uh, how we ended up having uh, uh, private property uh, that we operate on. So we have a a pretty good chunk of private property that we operate on. So we are not on public land. We are on private land. Which most land in Oklahoma is private. Uh, (laughs) Most of it, yeah. 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 Big obstacle if you're a Bigfooter in Oklahoma. You run across a lot of those barbed wire fences. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you do. And you, and yes, you don't do. want to get caught on the wrong side of one of those. No, 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 you don't. And, 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 and we, uh, we, we stay, uh, we stay in our own backyard. We don't have to go anywhere else. The, the, the apes are there. They come there. They will come to you. We have, we, they, they come visit. When we're there, they come to see us. Bob, I appreciate you coming on, uh, spending this time with me, telling us all the stories. Uh, You know, I know you're fending off COVID. You're a trooper, man. You're a trooper. 
Well, thank you. I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure, Matt. I really had a good time. Oh, you made my job extremely easy, man. (laughs) (laughs) Just ask Bob to talk and they don't shut up. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, check out uh, woodape.org. Is that the address? That's it, woodape.org. Bob Strain, thanks again. Thank you, sir. It's my pleasure, Matt. And if you've had your own encounter with a wood ape, a Bigfoot, a Sasquatch, an alien, a ghost, anything at all, send me an email at bigfootcrossroads at gmail.com. If you get a chance, check out the website, bigfootcrossroads.com. You can find links to merchandise, past episodes, social media, everything you need all in one place. And until next time, remember, there's something in the woods. Oh,